All right, everybody, the time is two o'clock and we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so, so much for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Desmond Martin. I am the program coordinator at Next Wave STEM. And uh, today's webinar is about teaching 3D printing remotely. Um, we at Next Wave STEM are all in completely invested when it comes to remote and distance learning for students right now. Um, we understand <laughs> we're living through it with you all as well. Um, the world is changing rapidly in ways that we really couldn't have imagined previously. And we are really, really excited, um, not for the gargantuan circumstances that have led us here, but just for this opportunity to continue to empower students. Um, we hope that you're excited to be with us um, as we're going to be covering really some meat and potato ways for you um, to bring this emerging technology to your students. Um, I will give the same spiel that I gave at the beginning of each one of our webinars in our series. Um, the first is that we are in webinar format. That means that you don't have to worry about being camera ready. Your cameras are not going to be open. Um, in the same vein, you don't have to worry about having your singing voice trained or your speaking voice trained because your audio is not going to be opened up either. But the chat is open. Uh, my colleague Sagundi Chagani, who is our school partnership specialist, is in our webinar with me monitoring the chat. Uh, in between the two of us, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns or just feedback. Um, if you drop it in the chat, we will absolutely see it and we'll make sure that um, if it's a question, we get it answered on air. And if we can't get it answered, if there's some reason we don't know the answer to your question or you just got something really, really good that takes a little, a little bit of research, um, we'll make sure to get back to you. Um, just general ground rules for our webinar today. Uh, once again, if you've got anything, go in the chat. We'll make sure that we cover it. And we're also going to make sure to leave maybe 10 um, minutes-ish at the very end so that we can take any questions that you might have. Um, so with all that being said, oh, yes, Sagundi so also just put in the chat, um, for those of us who are joining after about five minutes ago, um, we'd love to know more about you. So if you just want to drop in where you're from and what you teach, um, and who with, um, we would love to see that information in our chat with our participants today. So we will go ahead and press forward as um, we've got a decent amount to cover and a decent amount of time to cover it in. A great place for us to begin is at the beginning with Next Wave STEM. Uh, if you've been with us uh, for a couple of webinars now, you've seen <laughs> This, you might notice a little bit. If this is your first webinar with Next Wave STEM, welcome. Uh, Next Wave STEM, we are a startup that focuses on emerging technology with students, um, not focusing too much on our philosophy or our goal in the slide. Um, we really have a passion for empowering teachers and empowering students in emerging technologies. Um, we offer courses um, online with our instructional staff. Um, we're licensing curriculum for schools in emerging technologies with robotics, 3D printing, drone technology, computer, and AI. And the reason that we do this is because um, we understand that you, as educators, are integral, um, invaluable parts of the ecosystem, a part of the pipeline and process by which our students go from being just consumers of technology to producers of technology. My professional background is in mechanical engineering. And for me, it was transformative, truly transformative to get hands on with technology, design processes, the scientific method at an early age in middle school, in elementary school. Um, that created for me a pipeline and a path where I felt like I belonged in STEM fields, that I could be a native to this space. And I was able to be native to that space. I was fortunate enough to have a really passionate and really good teachers to expose me to the technology. And that was many, many years ago, but the same is true today. Our teachers 
your ability to get access to these emerging technologies. To understand these technologies yourself and to teach is going to be critical in the future outcomes of our students. Um, and we're going to need scientists, engineers, technologists, mathematicians, and really, really talented artists um, to solve the massive problems that we're facing. Even before there was a global pandemic, we have massive, massive problems that we need solutions to. Um, and I do truly believe that some of these kids that we educate right now are going to be the ones to fix those problems. Um, so thank you for your passion. Thank you for your dedication to uh, the teaching profession, the calling. Um, and thank you for not thinking it robbery to spend a little bit of time with us today. So let's get to what we want to cover. Our two main goals for today's webinar. Um, the first is that we're going to dig into our main computer aided design tool. Um, that is Tinkercad. Um, it's a cloud based application that allows us to teach those fundamental skills in um, computer aided design and um, 3D printing. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with Tinkercad. It looks extremely simple because it is extremely simple, but it's also extremely powerful. Um, there are things that your students, even as young as second grade, can do to form some really powerful skills in using Tinkercad. We want to explore that today. Um, the second thing we want to do is understand what will be an effective remote learning instructional model. Um, if I have a tool that I can use to teach an emerging technology, um, how can I do that remotely? That's really where the rub is. Um, even before we were focused on remote learning and distance learning, it was a struggle for us to learn this new tool and this new technology. And now I have to learn a new tool and a new technology and teach it online. Um, that's something that we're going to dig into um, and talk about the best ways for you to do that, some best practices, and um, even an example path that you might follow. So with all that being said, we'll dig right in. So the first thing you want to do is get into the flow with Tinkercad. Um, one thing I will mention is that I'm going to be doing some flip flopping back and forth in between my slide presentation and the actual digital application. We want to see it in action. Um, that way you don't necessarily have to worry about following along but <laughs> we will be recording this webinar and we will be sharing that recording with you along with the slide deck. So you'll have a little bit of a template to follow um, as you go back and look at this a little bit later on. So two things we want to take a look at with respect to Tinkercad today um, to get started, which is one, creating your own Tinkercad account as an instructor, as a teacher. The second thing, is how we can actually integrate that with our classes. How can we create a new class if we're native to Tinkercad? And if we are a school where we're using Google Classroom as our primary learning management system, how can we then pull that together with Tinkercad as well? Um, that's a powerful feature that um, we absolutely want to take advantage of if um, Google Classroom is our LMS of choice. So what I'll do kind of the cooking show style is back up through these slides that I'm skipping through by mistake. And I'll actually exit out of this presentation and go to our website. So this is Tinkercad. I've got something prepared a little bit ahead of time. But before I get into this, I want to go to that top level of Tinkercad and I'm actually going to sign out to do that. Having a little bit of a of a technological bug, but we'll be okay. There we are. Awesome. So Tinkercad, you have a couple of different ways that you can create a class of students that I want to show you. Um, when you go to the Tinkercad.com website, and I'll log out just momentarily to show this. The first time um, you sign up for Tinkercad, 
you have the ability to click on this tab that says teach. And this information will give you the ability to either join your class if your school has already set up a Tinkercad account for you, or you can create a class. Uh, I won't show you how to create an account. It's very simple. If you've got an email address and you've ever created any kind of online account before, you're going to be able to create that account <laughs> in this case. Uh, but what I will do is I'm actually going to sign back in with my own Google credentials. And now that I am signed in, I'm going to click on this Teach tab. Clicking on the Teach tab gives me a bunch of different options. Um, this is going to be our help center as teachers. Um, thinking about how we can add students to our classroom and giving us extra resources. Um, what I will do is actually click on my account manager and right in there, there is this option that says classes. When I click on classes, I will now be presented with this option of creating a new class native in Tinkercad. Um, this is basically where our class will live as we're working through Tinkercad. Creating a new class allows me to create a classroom name, uh, design things like what grades I'm working with. I'll pretend like we have our participants here today in our classroom. Um, I can even specify a specific subject and I can create that class. And now when it comes to managing that class, I can do things like a delete, change those grades, and change the subjects. Or I can click directly on the name of the class and add students. Um, this is as simple as it gets. Um, for each individual line, you can actually add students' names. So you can cut and paste right out of your spreadsheet of your student roster. Um, after you cut and paste out of that spreadsheet, you can add them directly to your class. Um, in this case, we'll do Joe. We'll do Susan. And then we'll also do Jackson. Now you can see as I go that there are also randomly generated nicknames. This is going to be really important because those nicknames are going to be how your students log into Tinkercad and join your class. Now that you have a class with some students in it and you've got nicknames, um, you can also generate what's called a class code. This makes sure that your students aren't logging into Tinkercad and aren't associated with your class. This brings everybody together underneath the same umbrella and this makes everything workable. When your students sign in with Tinkercad, they can sign in and input your classroom code. You can also make this really simple by copying the code and sharing it through a link via your email or via your LMS, if that's Google Classroom or Moodle, and your students would join in. And as simple as that, if they've got the classroom code and they enter that nickname that's in your classroom roster, they will be directly into your class in Tinkercad and they'll be ready to go. In that same way, if your class is using Google Classroom and your students have a Google account, as soon as they log in with their Google account into Tinkercad, they're already entered into the class that you've created as well if you've added their email addresses in Google Classroom. So you're all set, all ready to go. So we'll transfer back over to our presentation. Awesome. So we've created a new class and now we know that we can integrate this class with Google Classroom. What I'm also going to really encourage you to do once you've put things together logistically for your class 
is for you to build up your skills as an educator first when it comes to Tinkercad. Um, the best thing that you can do is actually play with the tool yourself. Um, and there are some basic things that you can learn via Tinkercad with the lessons that are available in their section. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, there's a great partner site that teaches 3D printing called Instructables. Um, we are not going to navigate over there just because we've got quite a bit of cup to cover and a little bit of time to cover it. But we've also got courses available for you at Next Wave STEM. Um, all of these are links in this presentation. And when I share the presentation with you, you'll be able to click on the link and be directed to the lessons on Tinkercad, the lessons on Instructables, and you can sign up to access our course resources at Next Wave STEM free of charge, not a problem at all. So what I'll do is I will actually navigate back over into Tinkercad. So we can show some basic ideas of what the tool allows us to do. Um, as you're working with your students, it's going to be really, really powerful for them to get a sense of what they can do by actually using the tool. Um, the great thing about Tinkercad is that they can't really break anything. Um, there's nothing that is so complicated that you can go in and delete or they can't delete the design. Um, there is a certain amount of artistic expression that your students will have to practice in order to get really good at using the tool. And Tinkercad is by and large a simple tool to use. Um, as you are using Tinkercad, it's all about dragging and dropping and resizing shapes. And these shapes can be extremely simple shapes or extremely complicated shapes. Um, and some of them are going to be useful for some purposes um, right from the menu. And some of them will allow us to finesse and change and adapt the shapes in ways that become really useful for us instructionally. So for our younger students, we may do something as simple as grabbing a box and pulling it out. And we may manipulate things like the angle that the box is turned. Say if we go through to 45-ish degrees, um, I can adjust easily the dimensions of the box, both in the how wide it is and how deep it is. But I can also adjust how tall it is. I've got precise measurements for the adjustments that I'm making, and I can adjust according to those measurements. So maybe I want to do something fractional. I can go 45.5 as my height, for example. Uh, Tinkercad is also really, really powerful because it allows me to get a three-dimensional view of what I'm building. Um, the whole purpose of the tool is to design objects that could be 3D printed. So if I grab this view cube and rotate it with my mouse, I can rotate the perspective of which I'm looking at an object. I can zoom in and zoom out as necessary. And if I grab this little uh, conical arrow, I can float objects up and down in the air. So that ability to manipulate objects is one really important tool that they're going to really need to learn. Um, we just got a really good question here. Um, yes, and Sagani is right on top of it. Is Tinkercad able to run through Chromebooks? Yes, it's completely cloud-based. Um, it means that if you've got a pretty decent internet connection, not even great, but decent internet connection, um, and it will run on all modern browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, Microsoft Edge, and I believe um, even the older um, version of Microsoft browsers, um, Tinkercad will run on. So we've got some versatility for your students, depending on what kind of platforms that they might be using. Um, back into Tinkercad, uh, uh, manipulating these shapes is one really critical part of the way um, that we design in Tinkercad. But another critical way that we design in Tinkercad is combining shapes, not just full solid shapes, but holes. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Um, so what I'll do before I show you what I mean is I'm actually going to adjust this particular shape. Um, so I'm going to flatten this guy 
out quite a bit. And I'm going to start to work with some other shapes. Um, if I take simple shapes and combine them together, I am able to make more complex shapes. So I have this square that I have now turned into this interesting rectangular prism, but I can also grab the cylinder and kind of mesh them together. So now I have these two shapes that are intersected a little bit. I'm also going to adjust the height of this shape. And I can use some of the different tools that I have. Tinkercad, if I select both shapes at the same time, has alignment tools that allow me to actually change the position of these shapes. So I get a little preview of where these shapes will go. So maybe I want my shapes to align up top that way. I can align also, if I change the view, how high these shapes sit. So maybe they're aligned in the middle or at the top face or with the lowest face like the way they were before. But now I've got the shape, things are meshed together. I'm going to adjust this cylinder back here a little bit. And I could actually take this particular shape and make something that allows us to have a more complex shape. And the way that I do this is I combine shapes together. So with both shapes selected like they are now, I hit this group button. And now this simple shape has now become this more complex shape that I can move all together. Got another really good question from Victoria. If you want to print something with wheels and you want the wheels to rotate, how would you do that with Tinkercad? I love that question. I'm going to put a pin in that question and that's going to be the very next thing that I show you. Um, so we've grouped these shapes together and we have this complex shape. But the thing is, um, we're making complex through addition. You can also make complex shapes through subtraction. So what I'll do is I'll grab one more cylinder and I'm going to pull the cylinder this way and it's going to mesh in very similar to the way I did the other shape. But this time, instead of leaving this shape solid, I'm going to click on this inspector up here. So it's a solid, I'm going to change it to whole. I'm going to change that to negative space. When I do that, you'll notice that this shape down here has actually gotten grayed out with the stripe. Um, that indicates that that shape is a shape of nothingness. And um, for those of us who remember our geometry, we can take solid shapes and, and um, add and subtract them from each other. So I'm going to take my two shapes now, select both of them, and group them again. And what will happen is that that solid shape literally gets cut out from the shapes that we had before. Through adding and subtracting shapes, I can pretty much make any shape that I can imagine in three dimensions. Um, that becomes the basis for everything that our students do. And the more clever we get with the way that we add and subtract shapes, um, the more complex and more robust things that we can really design with Tinkercad. So that's what I mean when I say, okay, Tinkercad is a simple tool, but a really powerful tool. So Victoria asked a really good question for an example here. What if I wanted to design wheels and have them rotate? A lot of times we see 3D prints come off a printer and everything is solid, it's not movable. Um, but there are ways, if we're clever, to print things that will actually move. And Tinkercad helps that with the kind of shapes that we're able to generate in Tinkercad. Um, if I want a wheel that spins, what I need is a wheel and an axle. And there is a set of shapes in these categories, which we'll also dig into a little bit more, that allow us to generate things like that. So if I go over to connectors, in connectors we have joints and sockets, things that we can program into our shapes to allow them to be opposable. But we also have handles and we have axles and I even have an already pre-designed wheel. So I'm gonna reset this design area so we can see a little better. I'll delete this shape and I'll grab a wheel. This wheel is 
portfolio design, the scaling in this case is locked. All that means is that I can't change the dimensions of the wheel, but I can change its orientation. So I can rotate it over this way. Well, we'll go negative 90 degrees, the full rotation. And I can also zoom in for us and I'll rotate this way so we can see that a little better. This wheel has a hole in the middle and has a socket right here on the side. That means that I can take another piece from our connectors and design in such a way where there can be a joint called a ball joint that goes into that socket. So I'll grab the seated ball joint. I will pull it into our workspace. So we've got our joint. And we can see here that there are two pieces that we can imagine. I'll rotate this piece a little bit more. Are actually going to get connected together. This ball will actually snap into the socket after you print them out. And the ball becomes a really, really powerful thing for us to work with because of grouping. I can take any shape that I've designed basically, like a square. I have to adjust my view a little bit. I can take that square, I can group it with my ball joint. If I've done a good job, that is. Yes, I am grouped together. And we can imagine this ball joint snapping into the socket in that wheel. And now I've got a wheel <laughs> that spins on the ball joint. It's got a ball joint, got a socket, and it spins inside of each other. That's something that I can print off of the three printer in pieces, snap together, and now we have things that are moving. So that's a really just basic example of the ways that we can design to get something to move in Tinkercad, but it's already built in. And while we won't get into the weeds of taking the design and putting it on a 3D printer and changing the scale and make sure everything works, um, that's the basic idea of really taking the parts that we have available for us in printing. So we've got this, these basic skills of adding and subtracting shapes and different kinds of shapes that allow us to do um, more complex things. So I'm going to jump back over to the presentation um, just to keep us moving forward. We've seen some cool stuff happening. Um, we have a little better idea of what's going to um, happen actually physically when it comes to skills and computer aid design that students might use and that you'll continue to grow in as well. So now we also want to expand our ideas for what we can do with a 3D printer. And that's where our different shape designations, those different connections that we build together, those different categories of shapes in Tinkercad really become powerful for us. Um, there are some things um, that students are gonna be able to build and some different kind of ways that we can think about design, especially since our students aren't in the classroom physically with us. They may or may not have access to a 3D printer, um, but they may have access to some other resources and Tinkercad allows us to take advantage of those resources and the design process as well. Um, got a really good question from Shannon here. Do students design and 3D print pieces for robots that they make? Yes, absolutely. Um, the amazing thing about a Tinkercad and just 3D printing generally is that there's a robust community of makers who are experimenting with di creating different shapes, different pieces, different things that can connect to a lot of the platforms that already exist. Um, there are really huge and robust communities of people who are doing 3D printing and making their own pieces that snap and connect with Lego pieces. If your students are working with Lego robotics, you've got an end right there. 
or even if they're working with a different robotics kit, um, there are all these different communities that they can access to. Um, if you've got some really um, specific questions about that, reach out to us and we can direct you into a little bit of a, of a more specialized uh, direction. Oh, we got another question here. Um, what is your favorite STEM activity with Tinkercad? Ooh, what's my favorite STEM activity? Um, if we're thinking about an intro activity, a really good thing that teaches students those skills of grouping both solid and, um, and hollow shapes together um, is allowing something that's gonna be personalized to a student. So it's actually two activities. The first thing I do is I teach them how to make a three-dimensional signature. Um, that's actually really, really functional um, because for the rest of my time in the course with them, um, they've got something that they can stick on to whatever they design so that if they print it, I know whose piece is whose. They've, they've actually signed it. It's kind of like chiseling your signature in stone. Um, but then there's also um, an activity where I have students design and print um, a keychain, a personalized keychain, something for themselves or something um, that they would design uh, for someone else. Um, that is a great way to get the basic sense of the geometry and some of the different shape classifications that students could use. Um, really good question. Those are my recommendations. I, I love, love, love doing that stuff. Um, okay, so we were talking about different shape categories that you can access in Tinkercad to allow um, your experience to be really, really powerful. Um, I'll show you kind of quickly, and we'll use the example here of Minecraft and a Lego mock-up that's native in Tinkercad. Doesn't have so much to do with 3D printing, but with the design process overall. And then some very useful shape categories. Um, the, those that are worked on by, by Tinkercad themselves, um, their new Make at Home categories, and the Oregon, Oregon um, Museum of Science and Industry, they've got some hangout space stuff that you may have never seen before, but it's really useful. Um, if you're experimenting with building circuits um, and working with Arduino, some of our educators on the line may be familiar with Arduino programming and building circuits and building components for Arduino. We can mock up and build and print components for our Arduino circuits in Tinkercad. And then there's something called printables, those objects that are designed for you to like pull out of Tinkercad and print right away. A really cool way to see the process in action and get some things that prove some other concepts, including um, balls, ball joints, and sockets. Um, so we will jump back into Tinkercad again and take a look at these different useful shape categories and even the Lego mock-up and uh, Minecraft mock-up. So in Tinkercad, uh, we've got our kind of uh, workspace here. I'm going to delete everything that we had in our workspace. And we want to focus now on our menu of work options where we can find more shapes. Clicking on that menu brings up what we saw before, connectors, but also our Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. They had a design competition a couple years back where they had interns actually design uh, furniture that they were going to use to furnish their new space. And um, they took those designs and imported them into Tinkercad. So that means that if we're doing interior design applications, I can grab a couple of seats, throw them together to make a nice little love or an actually a pretty ugly <laughs> little love seat there. Uh, grab a table. Well, not that particular table. So I'll delete this table with a small table. And maybe work with a little bit of interior design. Um, and since I'm definitely less spatially acute as my uh, spouse is. I'm sure that will make her happy to know that I'm able to generate some things that we can look at in real time and space. Um, that's something that our students as they're working through design applications are going to be able to go in and learn. Um, but I'm going to clear our workspace and also show um, in Tinkercad what's called Make at Home. 
for our students who are going to be quarantined or shelter in place for the foreseeable future. And some of us are coming a little bit closer to the end of that. Um, we can take advantage of common household objects that students might have to work with. Things like tissue rolls and pencils, both unsharpened and sharpened pencils. Um, we have students who are used to building bridges with toothpicks. Well, they can design um, in three dimensions what those toothpick bridges might look like. So you'll find common everyday household items in Tinkercad. And this really allows our students the flexibility where if they don't have access necessarily to the physical stuff, they can still design with it. And more powerfully, if they do have access to the physical stuff, they can now plan out their designs for engineering and construction projects in three dimensions, building a three-dimensional model before they ever put things together. Um, insanely powerful tool. Um, this is the kind of thing that takes the middle school um, science fair or engineering project to the next level because we can actually do some robust 3D planning. Um, this becomes a really, really powerful drawing tool for our students that way. So I'm going to select our workspace again because I want to get rid of everything. We're going to home in. Um, now, there is another really, really useful category of shapes that we can use in our assemblies um, for circuits. Uh, this becomes super cool if we're building circuits, if we're working through electronics. Um, we can actually mock up what those assemblies will look like in the real world. We can get our spacing correct. We can add things like lights and motors. I got to zoom up because that motor is a little big. Um, things that we might have in our classroom that students would be working with but don't have access to while they're at home, they can actually still do planning for. Um, and if I grab in the circuits components as well, if they're working with Arduino units, microcomputers, and learning how to program, we can pull out a board and actually plan out where our wiring routes are going to go. We can pull in servo motors. We can think about how we're going to connect from a breadboard. If my breadboard will cooperate with me, it might not. Let's grab a different breadboard. There we are. So we can think about how we're going to go from a breadboard. Um, we can think about different things like sensors or even Raspberry Pis. We, we can build whole projects. Um, and mock them up in Tinkercad. In the same way, I'll delete some of these extra breadboards that just appeared. In the same way that I can have a, a, an actual physical object, I can create that object as a whole as well. So if I'm 3D designing a component to go over an object or have the object live inside of, I can cut out the required negative space. Um, this is definitely on the upper end of what we might work with with our students in 3D printing, but it's an option that we absolutely have that makes Tinkercad a really, really powerful tool. So let's get rid of all these components as well. And another category of shapes that's really, really cool for our students to be using right now lives underneath printables. Um, two things I want to focus on in printables is first the Smithsonian printables. Um, Smithsonian National Museum in Washington, D.C. They went in and did highly detailed three-dimensional scans of some of their artifacts at the museums. Um, one of my favorites is the Apollo Command Module. I think this might cooperate with me. Yes. Um, this becomes an easy way. It's locked when we think about the scaling. So I can't necessarily, oh, I actually can before that. Well, I can actually print out these models and teach a little bit about physical history um, and the importance and dynamics of different objects in the real world. Um, 
because I can't visit <laughs> the real objects in the real world. Um, this becomes something that I can now share with my students in a new way. And if they have their own 3D printer, they can generate for themselves. Um, we'll come back to the command module because I also like to point out the skeleton and dinosaur models. Those become actual three-dimensional pieces I can pull out and snap together, in this case, the model of a skeleton. And you'll see, as I'm pulling some of these pieces out, and we'll take a look at them, that they are pre-designed. I'll focus on our forearm. They're pre-designed as sockets and ball joints. So when I print out this model, it will snap together. The same is true of this hip bone. I think we, we might remember that song, the hip bone connects to the knee bone, or the thigh bone, the thigh bone connects to the knee bone, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we can actually see, not anatomically correct, but a proof of a concept of how those things will work. There's also a little socket there in the back end of, the, of this skull. So that becomes something that's really quick, drag and drop, print and have for your students to be able to work with um, their own individual and personalized model if they're cutting and pasting different shapes into those models. Um, really, really fun. So I said that we would go back to that lunar module because it honestly is the coolest thing for me to show off with respect to some of the different view categories that Tinkercad has available. And you might be saying, okay, Desmond, what does that mean? You're kind of hitting us with a lot of information here um, and we're running out of time quickly, so I will accelerate. Um, when I talk about view categories, Tinkercad, of course, is a 3D design tool, but it's not just a 3D design tool in the sense of making photorealistic design, but of mocking up in other mediums as well. So in the upper right-hand corner, I've got uh, these icons. One of them looks like an, a pickaxe. And that pickaxe, if you've got any kind of students who have been alive in the last decade, is from Minecraft. So if I click on that pickaxe, and it's going to take my browser just a second, we have our 3D model actually rendered in Minecraft blocks. Um, this gives our students kind of the ability, if they're working through Minecraft and have been doing three-dimensional design, to think about how they could build a replica of their 3D object in Minecraft as well. And we can increase the resolution. So I can have it with uh, a medium number of blocks or a large number of blocks. Once my browser cooperates, there we have it. And there, with the large number of bots, we get a little bit of definition back in our lunar lander. You can see the curvature at the bottom of that as well. Um, and kind of in the same vein, if I go over from the pickaxe one more time, we have access to Lego bricks. This becomes a really, really powerful thing for us to use because for a lot of us, we might have a large cache of Lego bricks in our classrooms, or our students might have a large amount of Lego bricks that they're able to work with and do design with as well. In that same way, I can increase the resolution for the number of bricks in the design. So this is really simplistic. It's only uh, five layers high, but I can also do this larger design. Or, I can go a step further and do these much more robust designs. And the Lego examples for what our models might look like even make it more powerful for our students to use because if they click on layers, they can actually see a guided step-by-step -step layout for what their models might look like as they're building on top of them in order to make their design come to life in Lego bricks. Um, that takes a lot of bricks, but it also is there to give our students the ability to model what they've designed in 3D um, 
with an actual physical medium if they don't have access to the 3D printer. So I definitely wanted to take a little bit of time to show that off as um, that's something that's going to be really, really powerful for your students to use. So uh, time is running away from me. Um, we're going to continue to press forward because we want to talk about what an instructional model for 3D printing at home looks like. So far, we dealt with um, a lot of capabilities, and now we want to talk about, okay, what can I do in the classroom? So at Next Wave STEM, when we believe this applies to your classroom and even applies to a remote learning, um, we believe in the 5E instructional design model, where we engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And we do that using the tools that are in our toolkit, um, both with our design technology and Tinkercad, but also now more and more um, with the actual physical meeting or digital meeting tools that we have, whether that's Zoom or Google Meet or whatever your tool is, it might be Skype. Um, however you're meeting and having that time with your students, we leverage those tools along with the digital tool um, as instructors and as students to be able to work through that together. So this is a more broken out idea of what we mean by that. Um, throughout the course of the class, um, the live classes that we run at Next Wave STEM, um, this is the progression that we will follow with the class, an example progression. Um, it will start with a whole group direct instruction. Um, you're coming in, you're taking <laughs> your attendance, you're greeting and you're, and you're jumping into your class and you engage with the real world problem that your students want to solve. Um, and then we collaborate. It's an open dialogue and discussion moderated by your instructor as they explore the questions around the problems that they can solve. Um, that could be opening up your microphones or using the group chat feature. Um, small group collaboration happens where you might have separate breakout rooms or you're using group chats or collaborating with a tool. Um, from there, you will jump back into whole group live instruction. Um, that's where we're teaching the tool. We're working through examples together in the technology in Tinkercad. Um, from there, we're gonna break out into individual or independent work, if that's something that you have specified for your students for that day. Um, so your instructor is able to pop in on your students and see how they're doing through a screen share and comparison of work. And then um, there's the elaboration and evaluation. And that can live in your LMS. Um, as your students are saving their work and they're submitting their work, their progress from the day, um, whatever documentation that might look like or the actual 3D printed file that can live in Google Classroom or in Moodle or whatever tool that you're using. So the question as a really um, point and click example of a real world example, um, what's a real world problem for students to engage with? Well, it's a 3D printing course, so we can rip it right from the headlines. Um, students can learn how to make actual devices that are gonna help with COVID-19. Um, and we're talking about PPE. Um, they can make lead filtration devices for homes that are dealing with lead pipe problems as well. Um, but it's really simple for them, much simpler than you might actually think for them to design things like components for face shields, a mask and respirators, or even uh, assistive touch devices. Um, and there are lots and lots of resources available in digital file libraries that students are able to engage with if they want to download and modify other files as well. Um, as they're exploring, um, you're sharing back and forth. Your screen share feature is your best friend. Um, you're checking in with your students constantly. Um, do you understand what's happening? What's your, your idea? Um, you're making sure that you're engaged and you're able to mark up and share what you're designing, your thought process as you're going through your instruction. Document collaboration tools are going to be extremely powerful for you. Um, once upon a time, it might have been difficult for everyone to share their ideas live. And you certainly don't want all of your students kind of yelling into the microphones and trying to figure out how to talk that way. Invite all of your students to a Google slide and assign them a slide to take notes in. 
Um, that's the kind of thing that lives persistently and that you can go back and refer to at any time during the class or after the class as a part of your evaluation process for what your students are able to understand. Um, we know that's a little bit prohibitive. It can be depending on how good a, your students typing skills may be. So that may be a combination of students taking notes and your verbal um, records as well. Um, and depending on your school and your school district's policies with regards to compliance to COPA, you may also be recording your class sessions as well. Um, the elaborate, elaboration and evaluation, the feedback and assessment process can all completely live in your um, in your LMS. Um, so if you're typing summative assessments, uh, if you're completing assignments by specific parameters and 3D printing design or just the completed finished product, all that can live in Google Classroom. Um, the 3D printing file format that's most commonly used, the STL file format also lives natively in Google. It can be emailed, it can be shared, it can live in Google Classroom or Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas really, really easily. So that's something that's, that's really simple for you to access and physically print later on. So you might even be thinking about, okay, we're doing a lot of design, but I wanna go through the 3D printing process. And the, the longer story of that will <laughs> actually take a little, little bit more than an hour that we have to cover. Um, think about 3D printing as a three-step process. Um, the design that your students are going to be able to do, the slicing where the actual object they design is translated into the computer code for your particular printer or for your students' particular printer, and then the actual physical printing where things are getting hot, plastic is melting, melting and the machine is moving. Um, we can actually take your students' designs and kind of farm out the printing to use an educator if you've got a 3D printer and you know how to run your printer or uh, going back to that uh, cooking show model we've got this repaired we can use a 3D printing um, company many of them are swamped right now but we can actually place an order for them to take our actual object you can just hit export and click on this 3D printing tab and in this case, a company you like prints a thing. I'll click on that tab and while that's going, I've already uh, filled out an order sheet. Prints a thing will take the STL you design natively in Tinkercad. It can show you it here, give you your dimensions. You can change some settings like infill and thickness uh, and you can add it to a cart. In this case, my object from print thing is going to cost $20 and they'll ship that out to me. So I can design something and it doesn't have to be something from Tinkercad. It can be my own design and we can have it physically printed and shipped to the students. So we are not locked into just existing in the headspace of the design process. So we can go from um, learning how to use the tool, though in a process in which our students can use it and then leverage our curriculum resources to take us through the lessons as our students are learning about 3D printing, even at a distance. So the next logical question is, how can we continue to support you when it comes to 3D printing at Next Wave STEM? Well, there are a couple of things that we're able to do. Um, one of those things you're already currently doing um, and we're going to be doing for the foreseeable future all throughout the summer. Um, for you as educators, um, we're going to be continuing to offer our, our free PD sessions so that you can expand your skill set and learn about some different options for remote teaching. Um, we'll be running repeats of um, the webinars that we did this week. Um, the webinar on Tuesday about how to teach STEM remotely and how to teach 3D printing remotely. We're gonna run that again uh, next week and get some other interesting questions. Um, I'll stay a little bit uh, <laughs> closer to my script so you don't have to rush so much at the end. Um, but connect with us and share with your colleagues so that they can have access to professional development as they're focusing on remote learning as well. We're also, however, going to be making our remote learning available for schools. 
our certified instructors are able to conduct classes in remote learning in 3D printing, drones, and robotics. So if you're concerned about having the resources and the bandwidth yourself, we can step in and do that instruction for you to make sure that your students are getting robust, effective STEM learning. Um, and those experiences can be either with or without the technology. In this case, we show an example where um, we didn't have a 3D printer. Um, your students didn't have a 3D printer, but we can make those 3D printers available for your students. Reach out to us um, and we can talk about ways that we can get you the specific technology that you need. And we're thinking about the future as, as well. Um, the curricula that we use at Next Phase STEM, we do licensed curric curricula so that you can use it in your school in your format, just the things that you need. Um, and it also becomes a situation where you're going to transition away from remote and go um, in person. Next Wave STEM is going to be doing teacher training, teaching you and training you on the technology and the curricula, as well um, as if you're in the Chicagoland area, we can make physical instructors available for you. We want to make sure that you have what you need at the uh, best of our ability to provide it. Uh, I got another question here from uh, Stanley. Can you save files into your CAD? And if so, can it save and convert to other formats besides STL? Yes. Um, when you save files into your CAD, it's actually an automatic save function. So as soon as you start dragging and dropping or deleting things in a file, it's going to be saved automatically. You can export to SG, um, STL, but you can also save as SVGs and some other file formats as well natively in Tinkercad and download them onto your machine or upload them to the cloud really, really simply. Really good question there. So because that was a really good question, this is a chance for me to pause. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left in our webinar, but I do want to open the floor up for any questions that you might have. I know I kind of hit you with the fire hose, but um, if you've got any questions, you can drop them in and we'll get you some answers. And this is the part where I'm a little bit silent as I know those fingers are typing away furiously. Oh, they're already coming in quickly, awesome. Uh, do I have a favorite brand of 3D printer? Who do I have a favorite? Favorite brand? The short answer is I don't have a favorite brand. <laughs> uh, the, the comparison that I make with a 3D printer is that they're kind of like automobiles. Um, they all do the same thing at the basic level. Um, you put fuel into your automobile, it gets you down the road. Um, you could, might have a Honda, you might have a Mercedes, you might have a Chevy, um, but they're all basically doing the same thing and the features are different. Um, I've experienced some 3D printers that are expensive and not great. I've experienced some 3D printers that are not um, particularly expensive. And for what I'm using, um, if it's prototyping or just doing proof of concept, it's really awesome. So it really depends on what you need. Um, if I were to say, is there a brand that you can reliably go to, has good customer service, um, I would um, recommend that you check out our list that Segundi has also just dropped into uh, the chat. Um, just some resources on the best 3D printers people have available. Um, things from um, Creality, for example, or Pressa. Um, another question here, can Tinkercad be applied to an interior design class or teaching electro components of auto services? Um, great questions. Uh, I would say that the interior design class, absolutely. Um, really good tools there to um, measure out space um, and actually create even architectural spaces and filling those out with um, assets like chairs and, and a furniture. Um, not as robust a tool as SketchUp, for example, for doing that, um, but you could use that for Tinkercad. Um, teaching about electrical components of auto services, not so much. Um, just because those components aren't very easy to find and import as STL files. Um, that's something that may change in the future, but for right now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for that. Um, and then 
there's another question. Yes, uh, really good question. Can you easily see students work? Um, if you are having your students in the class, you can have access to the um, files that they're designing. Um, can you see it live in progress as they're designing and manipulating? Not so much. Um, you have to go one at a time and looking at them, but through the classroom functionality, either through Google Classroom or through the native Tinkercad classes, um, that's something that you can really easily see. Um, I got another question here. Um, do you encourage grade two students to use Tinkercad uh, in the classroom and how to encourage other teachers to get in the bandwagon with, with Tinkercad? Ooh. Um, I encourage grade two students because as they're learning about basic geometry, shapes, um, this becomes a really powerful way to talk about shapes and parts of shapes as they're working through um, Tinkercad. And it's also a great way to explore their artistic expression. Um, that becomes really powerful for them as they're thinking of working in 3D spaces with different objects. Um, so yes, absolutely encourage Tinkercad um, for our grade two students. And um, just a comment here. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Some of us are saying that this is working to expand our thought processes. Good. Um, you can go down so many amazing rabbit holes when it comes to 3D design with Tinkercad or with any kind of CAD software to, um, that you might use. Um, I like Tinkercad and we encourage Tinkercad because for those are, who are just beginning, it um, is something that's really, really accessible. Uh, and then we have also, um, what do you know about students earning CTE, technical education certificates? Um, Gregory, great question. What I would say to that is that um, CAD becomes a really powerful tool for that. And um, with respect to Tinkercad, Tinkercad lives in the Autodesk um, ecosystem of products. So Tinkercad is your basic introductory product. From there, the natural step up is to Fusion 360, which is for designers and makers and basic engineering. And then they can go into Autodesk um, Inventor and some of the specialized architectural products. Um, students who learn Tinkercad first are kind of naturally moving that progression of learning and using those other more robust tools that they'll use in CTE um, courses, especially when we think about architecture. So um, if you've got some students who have never done any kind of CAD software before, they need the most basic um, place to start with CAD software, Tinkercad provides a really, really natural instruction, no path for that as they're growing in those skills. Uh, well, I know we've actually gone over time, but um, it, this was amazing to have all of you with us. Um, I do, before we go, want to drop uh, contact information. Um, Desa Martin, that's my face in black and white. Um, on your screen off to the side, I think, is my face in color. Um, you can reach out to me about any questions that you have. Um, just a reminder for our Illinois educators, um, this is a professional development certified session. Um, so you'll be receiving a follow-up email with a certificate for that professional development hour. Make sure to also click on the survey link that is included in the follow-up email. And for all of our participants today, you'll be receiving um, the YouTube link for the video copy. The YouTube link is also going to have the playlist of our other professional development options for you to take a look at. And you'll be receiving the slide deck so that you can use that as a reference. Um, to all of you, thank you so much for attending. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Um, we've got another webinar coming up next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Um, we hope to see you all on that one as well. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will speak to you all soon.